Hi students, welcome to HSC Chemistry and Module 7, Organic Chemistry. This is video number 11 and this time we're going to be looking at bonding within and between the hydrocarbon. So we've had a bit of an introduction to the key relationships between properties um, within a homologous series and also a little bit of a look at hybridization and how that affects the shape of different molecules or at least the distribution of atoms around a central carbon. So now we want to extend that a little bit more so that we can look at differences both within and between members of homologous series uh, with reference to intermolecular and intramolecular bonding present. So there's a lot of terms in this particular one, so we need to make sure that we're aware of all of these terms and that we can use them correctly. So when we're looking at bonding, we're looking at bonding within or intramolecular and intermolecular. So let's just make sure that we're clear about the difference between those. So firstly, uh, when we look at a molecule like ethane, what we're doing is we're looking at firstly what types of bonds are within this particular molecule. So here is ethane. And you can see that these, all of these atoms are held together to each other by covalent, nonpolar covalent bonds. So that's what's happening within this molecule. So within this molecule, all of these atoms are held tightly together with uh, chemical bonds, and the chemical bonds are covalent, and the covalent bonds are nonpolar because of very small or zero differences in electronegativity of the atoms involved. So those are the intramolecular forces that are acting to keep these atoms together. But what holds two molecules of ethane together? Well, what holds them together? So be between these are intermolecular forces. So now if I have two ethane molecules, then what you can see is that I still have my uh, nonpolar covalent bonds within this molecule and within this molecule, but something else which is holding these molecules close together. And in a solid, which is kind of hard to imagine ethane as a solid, um, or as a liquid, again probably equally hard, um, there must be some force which is holding these molecules close enough together to either retain a solid structure or at least not uh, or prevent them from flying off um, as they do as a gas. And that, and that force, that thing that is holding these together is a dispersion force. In fact, it's a couple of different dispersion forces between these molecules. So dispersion forces are our intermolecular forces and our covalent bonding is our intramolecular force. So when we look at each of these, uh, we can get a sense of what's going on just with a comparison table. And these sorts of comparison tables are really, really useful for you, um, not only for answering questions, but also to help with your study. So when we're looking, firstly, we need to compare the properties. So we need to look at chemical and physical properties. And in order for us to do that, we need to have some understanding of the nature of the bonds within and between different groups the types of bonds and some of the consequences. So firstly, if we look at chemical properties, this is about reactivity primarily. So if we put reactivity up here, and we know that chemical properties are about how reactive they are with different other types of substances. We know that the functional groups where there are double or triple bonds, so the unsaturated hydrocarbons, are the ones that are more reactive than those with just single bonds. And this is partly, I guess, easily explained just through that higher electron density. So the actual fact that we've got four or six electrons in the same kind of region of space as opposed to two, is gonna exert a greater repulsive force, and therefore they're gonna be, if you like, more readily broken uh, in chemical reactions. So 
That's one possibility for chemical reactivity, um, just based on differences in those functional groups between the single, double, and triple bonds. The type of bonding that's occurring in terms of intramolecular are covalent bonds. And the reason that these are important when we're talking about chemical properties is it's actually the bonds within the molecule that are going to be broken if we're going to uh, react this chemically. So either something might be substituted for here, maybe the whole molecule will break apart if I expose this to oxygen with some heat. Certainly what I'll end up with is a, a reaction called combustion. And that's going to create, depending on the amount of oxygen I have available, carbon dioxide and hydrogen oxide or water. So all of those bonds are going to be broken in that particular case. But it's covalent bonding that we're going to be uh, breaking for our chemical property. The consequences are that alkynes and alkenes are more reactive than alkanes. And that's kind of a bit, a bit of a general statement. And we're going to be doing some experiments to, to hopefully reinforce that as we go further on. In terms of the physical properties, the fact that there are nonpolar covalent bonds within uh, the molecules of the alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes means that in terms of the physical properties, the only intermolecular forces that are occurring, as we mentioned before, are dispersion forces. We do have three choices, which are hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole interactions, or dispersion forces. But both dipole-dipole interactions and hydrogen bonds require polar bonding somewhere in the molecules for them to interact. And of course, they have to involve hydrogen if they're going to be hydrogen bonds. So this is a really important distinction here. The fact that there are hydrogens does not make it automatic that there is hydrogen bonding. The only way we get hydrogen bonding with hydrogens is if the hydrogens are part of a polar covalent bond. And in these molecules, they're not. So no hydrogen bonding, no dipole-dipole interactions. The only thing holding them together are dispersion forces. Now dispersion forces are the weak intermolecular forces. And so that means they're relatively easily overcome. So they do affect things like melting point and boiling point. They may also affect things like density and solubility. And there are also other physical properties you could talk about, such as whether they're brittle or malleable, their appearance, their color, any of those sorts of things. But in terms of trying to explain um, different trends and different properties, it's probably better to focus on things like these changes of state. Consequences are things like low melting and low boiling points because we're only overcoming dispersion forces, but there will be some trends and some patterns that we can see. And let's have a look at one to go into a little more detail. So here is some plots for um, the molar masses of the alkanes. So this here is methane and ethane and prop and bute and pent and hex. And you can see there's a nice straight line here. Now I've put a little bit of a line that best fit on here, but I put it in as a dotted line. It's very important that we remember that when we put lines on graphs, what we're indicating is a mathematical relationship. Y equals mx plus b is the equation for a straight line. But what that also assumes is that every pair of x and y values should lie on that line, and we can't have anything between methane and ethane. So really what we can look at here are some trends, but not a mathematically describable relationship. So, so there is a difference when we're looking at, at graphing things in this way. That said, the trend is pretty obvious and pretty strong. When I put that straight line in, most of the points are very, deviate a very small amount from that line. So we know that there's a pretty strong relationship between these. And when you're looking at graphing, you've got two things that you're going to need to do. You need to describe the trend, and you need to explain the trend. So if you can do both of these things with any data that you're given, you may have to 
draw the graph from data itself. We might give you a table of values and you need to, to put these in a, in a plot. But when you do that, you can see that the trend is very easy. Now, correlation does not always equal causation. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we just see the two things are correlated. There's a nice relationship between them, but it's not necessarily saying that A causes B or X causes Y. In this case, we can see and we can describe this trend as an increase in the molar mass increases the boiling point. So as the molar mass increases, the boiling point increases. And why does the molar mass increase? Because the chain length increases. Even more simply, because the number of carbons in the chain is increasing. So any of these are descriptors. There's no explanation at the moment. Having more carbons results in a higher boiling point is still a description of the trend. It's not an explanation. So how does it go from being a description to an explanation? Well, when we explain the trend, that's when we must bring in things like um, intra and intermolecular forces. Specifically, our explanation should involve the fact that the uh, intramolecular forces are the same. So there's no difference um, between them. There may be more of them, but there's no difference between them. Um, however, the intermolecular forces are relevant and uh, increase with the size of the chain. And what are we specifically talking about here? Well, the intermolecular forces that we're talking about here are dispersion forces. And the number of dispersion forces between molecules will increase as the, as the length of the chain increases. Now that's the length of the chain, not the total mass, because we can have the same mass of different compounds um, with different arrangements, with different packing around those central carbons. And that's why we had to look at isotopes, because they're a very important group. So when we're explaining this trend, the intramolecular forces are less relevant they're all covalent, they're all no, uh, non-polar, so there's nothing in there for us to look at. But in terms of the intermolecular forces, what's actually holding the molecules together are dispersion forces, and the number of dispersion forces is going to increase as the size of the chain increases, and therefore there's going to be an increase in the amount of energy required in order to overcome those attractive forces and move the molecules apart. This is how we go from a description to an explanation of a trend. It's important to have a look at lots of data about lots of these. I've just looked at the straight chain, straight chain alkanes uh, with no side branches. And if you start to put side branches in, you might start to see a few other interesting things happening as well. What might be a useful exercise is to plot against a graph like this the same values for the corresponding alkene and alkyne. So obviously there's no meth version, but for ethene and ethine, propene and propyne, have a look at how the, the boiling points uh, change relative for each of these ones, and then see if you can explain those trends too, which gives you a nice little uh, activity uh, in terms of whether or not you can apply your understanding of structure and bonding to properties. Thanks for watching.